I didn't understand because that was the first time I was ever told that I couldn't do something or be like everybody else with a few modifications. Hey there, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 466, and today I'm joined by Mr. Jason Davis. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here at Whistlekick, founder here at Whistlekick, chief cook and bottle washer here at Whistlekick, and I love traditional martial arts, and that's why I've invested all of my time, all of my money, all of my heart into everything that we're doing here, and I hope that that comes through. And if you want to check out all the things that we're doing, go to whistlekick.com. There's links all over the place to the different projects and products that we make. Speaking of products, there's a store. And if you make a purchase, use the code PODCAST15. That'll save you 15% off. Maybe a shirt or a hoodie or a uniform or some gear. It's all kinds of good stuff. Check that out. We've got another site for this show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you can find out everything about this bi-weekly show, with the goal of connecting and inspiring and educating martial artists all over the world. Martial arts means a lot to a lot of different people, and our goal here is just to support that and to give you more. And if you value those things that we're doing, whether you make a purchase or not, or there's another way, a newer way that you can support us, through Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you spend more than $5 a month, which really isn't that much, right? All the stuff that we're bringing you, $5 a month, you're going to get more. We're going to give you more stuff on top of the free stuff that we give you. And it's just another way that you can say thank you and let me say you're welcome in advance and thank you for all that you do to support this show. I've known of today's guest for years. He's doing something pretty amazing pretty much in my backyard. And for some reason, I have not met him yet, but it's going to happen. And logistically, we record it over the internet because it's just easier. It gives better quality. But I don't want anybody to think that I'm averse to sitting down. We used to do a lot of those. And I'm sure I'm going to meet Mr. Davis sometime soon and sit down and we're going to have a long chat because he's doing great things. One of my favorite things about martial arts is that that passion for martial arts can manifest in very different ways for very different reasons. And today's guest is a great example of that. Martial arts changed his life, and now he's on a mission to help others change their lives through martial arts. Let's get into it. Here he is. Mr. Davis, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time and, and glad to be here this morning. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on. We were, we were chatting, and uh, you know, I, we, we both have kind of vague memories of it, but we tried to do this at some point, and, and I think you expressed it well, that it wasn't the right time, but I'm glad we found the right time. Oh, me too. And you're here because I'm, I'm excited to talk about your story and the things that you've got going on because they're, they're big and they're powerful, and I think more important than either of those adjectives, important. It's, uh, well, I'm glad you're excited to, to talk about it because, uh, quite frankly, after almost 10 years, my wife is like, I'm so sick of hearing your story. You know what I mean? She's just, she's like, you've, it's the same thing over and over and over. So it's nice to have a fresh set of ears, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it's important to make sure that you're, you're sharing the wealth when you're, when you're talking about your, your victories and your losses and not dumping too much on too many people at the same time. I mean, my, my cat gets the brunt of it. I live alone. So <laughs> yeah, she, uh, well, she's, she travels with me a lot. And so she's, here's the, the same thing. And she's like, you even have it down to like the short version, the, the medium version and the, and the long version. She said, and you know which one to pick. And I said, well, that's just, you know, that's, that's part radio experience and, and part just knowing what fits. And she goes, but I got to tell you, she says, I'm sick of hearing it all. She says, well, then we'll make sure if she listens to this, that she skips over the first, however many minutes you've got the, the short, the medium and the long version. I'm going to let you choose whichever of those versions seems most appropriate for right now and tell us because i've got a feeling that that story not only is what you're doing but how you started martial arts am i guessing right you did it, you got it uh, right on the head and and it is uh you know i don't i don't see it that way and she doesn't see it that way because because we're around it all the time but i guess when you sit back and look at it from from thirty thousand feet you know it is a story of of uh of inspiration and and overcoming and and just not taking no for an answer 
And um, and so it is something that's that's worthy of sharing. And I'm glad to have this platform to do it. Let's dig in. Let's do it. Give us give us that that story, that origin story, and how you found martial arts. Well, you know, I was born with cerebral palsy, and um, I am the youngest of five. And uh, my parents were actually told by the doctors that they didn't think that I was going to survive. Um, you know, I had some some serious uh, health complications, and they brought in a priest and gave me last rites. And uh, they said, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen. And um, so I, I survived that. And my parents um, had no experience with any disabilities before or anything like that. As I said, I'm the youngest of five, and and everybody else. Um, is is normal whatever that is supposed to mean and uh they said you know no we're going to take them home and uh we're going to figure this thing out and that's exactly what they did and they uh raised me like my other brothers and uh sister um i was told that i could do anything i wanted to if i put my mind to it and uh it wasn't excused from chores or anything like that uh i was expected to do it um i was expected to do uh, the same things that they did and and behave the same way that they did. Um, Just had to think about things and do things differently. And so for me, um, you know, life with cerebral palsy uh, was normal and, uh, and I didn't let it stop me. And uh, it probably wasn't until I was the age of eight that I kind of realized that maybe I was, was different. Um, Up until that time, uh, I was the first to, student with a disability to be integrated into the regular classroom. I had regular friends, whatever that means. And, and we did, we did regular stuff. Um, they treated me the same way as they did everybody else. And, um, you know, I, I wrestled with my older brothers and, and did everything like that. And, uh, you know, it started out, um, that my mom used to yell at my older brothers, stop that. You're going to hurt him. Stop that. Well, she finally realized that, you know, I was the one that was instigating all this. And she finally said, you know, if, if you're going to do that, then you're going to get what your brothers give you, you know. And so it was it was, uh, you know, the double chicken wing and the headlock and, and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, and so I was treated and, and raised like every, you know, like everybody else. And um, as I said, in school, it was the same way. And uh, I really looked up to my older brothers. Um you know, uh, they were, they were my big brothers and and I wanted to be just like them. And, and, uh, so when I was about eight, as I said, uh, my older brothers started in martial arts and, um, I wanted to, too. And so my parents said, well, fine, we'll call the school and, and get you, get you going. And, uh, this was the early eighties. Uh, not as much was known about disabilities then. And over the phone, they were told that uh, I couldn't train. I never would be able to train. And, and kind of what were they doing calling a martial arts school to find out if a kid with a disability that's in a wheelchair could train in martial arts? That it, that it didn't actually make any sense. And so for me, when I was told that, it was, it was a pretty big blow. Um, and, I, and I didn't understand because that was the first time I was ever told that I couldn't um, do something or be like everybody else with a few modifications and I, and I didn't get it. Um, but as I grew up, um, you know, uh, that sort of stuff went by the wayside and, uh, me and my friends were me and my friends and I didn't think much about it. Um, I got into school and, uh, and, um, I actually found that some learning disabilities went along with the, the physical. So, um, I'll get into that part in just a second but uh that first section do you have any uh, questions for me about that i feel like i need to give you a second here to <laughs> well i, to, to I appreciate that and don't, don't worry if, I, if i've if i've got to break in i'll break in um but no I, I i i'm following along with you i'm nodding along and 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 interested where this is going and you're 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 giving us a lot of details and i appreciate that please continue yeah i i pop in you know i pop into the regular school system and and have regular friends, as I said, and, uh, academically, uh, you know, uh, found that I had some difficulties and I had been going to school since I was two years old. It was a school for early education, which, which incorporated my physical therapy. And so by the time I got to the sixth grade, you know, I was like done with school. I was like done with it, you know? 
um, had the, the learning disabilities that made it difficult, um, was basically told that, um, you know, I was being lazy, um, you know, that I, that I didn't like school, uh, and that I just didn't apply myself. And, and that was partly true, but, uh, it wasn't until the age of 12 that I found out that I had those learning disabilities that went along with the physical. So you fast forward a little bit and you hop into junior high and that experience was a little bit better. Um, academically, it was, it was a lot of fun, uh, from a social standpoint. Uh, I had a lot of friends, did a lot of stupid stuff, uh, just like other teenagers and, uh, just really enjoyed it. Um, academically though, I, I didn't still didn't care to be there, just wanted to get through. And, um, Basically, I was told that uh, I needed to go to college. And I said, well, college isn't for me. Um, and, and they said, well, how do you ever plan to be successful? And I said, I don't, I don't know. And I don't care. I just want to just wanna get out of here. You know, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know. Hang out with my friends. I'll figure it out. Whatever. Um, you know, I, uh, I had summer jobs just like everybody else. And so I felt like it was going to be easy for me to find a job. Um, you know, fast forward to graduation. I'm an 18 year old kid with all the answers. Um, and then the real world hits and, uh, it's like, okay, all your friends are going off to college. You're hanging out on the porch in the summer. They're all gone back and, and life isn't so, so fun anymore. Well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I'm just going to get a job. It'll be easy. You know, I'm like, uh, I've got work experience. I got a ton of computer experience from hanging out in the computer lab at high school every chance I got when I didn't want to be in class. That's where it hide, you know, uh, I was like, this will be easy. Well, I actually found out that it was going to be very difficult. And, uh, I was told by several state agencies that, uh, I was unemployable, uh, worthless, and I would never hold down a job and I should go to the mailbox and collect a check every month and be happy with it. And I said, I don't know who you're talking to, but you're not talking to me. That's not me. And that's not what I'm going to do. And they're like, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. So um, I uh, I began volunteering and I volunteered at the, the local grade school and volunteered here and there. And volunteering was great. You know, I, uh, you know, I could do great things as a volunteer, but it wasn't paid. And uh, and so I finally, finally realized that maybe I did need to swallow my pride and 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 get some job placement help. And I contacted the state, I had a, a lady I was friends with and she said, you know, this worked for my husband. Why don't you give it a try? And I said, all they're going to tell me is I got to go to college to be successful and I'm not going. She goes, please give it a try. And, uh, and so I did, I got a hold of a counselor and, uh, and then that's the, the, the next part for me, uh, was my career in radio. I have a question, a thought at, at, at this point. So quite often when we, when we talk about children, who have a challenge, you know, whether that's an academic challenge or a physical challenge, they tend to turn, you know, if they have an academic challenge, they tend to become a, a pretty physical kid. They find that place in the world where they feel comfortable and confident. And that's the direction that life often takes them. You know, if it's someone who maybe is a little smaller, um, you know, pushed around a little bit, this is, you know, my identity, I gravitated toward academics. But what's interesting to me about when you're talking about your childhood, you're not, it, it doesn't sound like you're talking about someone who didn't have a place where they felt comfortable. You know, you talked about academics weren't your thing. And, you know, you're talking about how physicality, you know, while you were able to keep up is, is kind of the sense I'm getting. I'm not getting the impression that that's where you were spending all of your time. So I'm wondering, what were you doing as a kid? You were hanging out with friends, but, but, what was your thing? Uh, we, we did, uh, we did anything you could think of. I mean, I remember, I remember playing football in the backyard, believe it or not. And, and they're on their feet and I'm crawling around, you know? And, and so it was kind of like makeshift kind of football and, and, and we wrestled around and, and rough house. But I think for me growing up, uh, you know, after that seven or eight period where you're really trying to find yourself <clears throat> for me, um, you know, we, we played, video games and, and we were into computers and, and things like that. And then we hung out at the mall and, and just did, I don't know, to me, what seems to be typical stuff that kids of the eighties, eighties did, you know? Um, 
So I, I don't know if I can really give much of an answer, you know, to that other than what we did seemed normal to me and it seemed okay to them. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, so I, I, fi- I figured that it couldn't be too far off, off base, but, uh, if you look, if you look at my, um, at my time during high school, um, my brothers had, had race cars. And from the time that I was about 10 until I was 14, uh, everything was about, you know, dirt track racing for me. And, and I could tell you how to build a, a dirt modified from top to bottom. And I could tell you how to, to build and tear down a, uh, a Chevy 358 and, and all that goes with it. And I could tell you all the numbers on the racetrack and, and the drivers that belong to those numbers. Um, but I couldn't do my math. And that was one of the things that the teacher said, you know, how do you know all this stuff about racing? And, and you can do that inside now, but you can't, you know, do your math or remember your spelling words. And I said, cause I don't care about that stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, this is, this is what I love. This is what I do. And so, racing was a big, a big part of, of that. And it was a big family thing that was, we all did it together. And, and even that, I mean, you know, everybody had their, had their part, you know, and, uh, and I had mine too, you know, you crack up the car and, and they'd be like, well, we'll let, we'll let Jason have a hammer and, and, and beat the body panels back into shape, you know, or, or change the oil. So all growing up uh, from my family to my friends, they all found ways for me to, uh, to fit in and, and ways for me to contribute. And that was, that was huge. And, and that was very important to, to who I am today. Cause I don't look at myself any different. I'm like, Oh, you want to do it? Well, figure out how to do it. Sure. Why, why would you think that you can't, you know? And, and that comes from, as they say, raising, so to speak, you know what I mean? Mm. In high school, I found another interest, uh, which also, this is where the martial arts gets tied into things. Um, and uh, that interest, Jeremy, was was the rescue squad. My brother, uh, well, two of my brothers and my sister and my sister-in-law were members of the, the local rescue squad in town. And um, at the time, uh, you know, I was like, 15, 14, 15, 16. Um, and I had some anxiety issues that, that went along with, with having a disability, I think, and, and being so close to family and, and things like that. And I was always worried about medical issues. Uh, you know, my parents had some, some health issues and I'm like, well, what if, you know, what if this were to happen and, and, and things like that. And so my sister-in-law said, uh, why don't you, why don't you just come and, and at least take the, take the, the classes that go along with, with being on the rescue squad. And she got clearance for me to do that and uh, just, just learn about this stuff. So you're not so afraid. And so that you know what to do, you know, CPR and basic first aid. And so I said, Oh, that'd be great. And um, you know, so I'm, I'm 16 years old in high school, barely, barely making it by. And, and I, I sign up for this class and I take the class like everybody else. So it's a big, a big thick book that you're reading. And, uh, um, you know, she helped me with the reading and, uh, and I, um, it ended up that I ended up uh, getting on the, the, the rescue squad at the end of it. Um, not only did I get on the rescue squad, but I, I passed the, the written test, uh, with a hundred percent and I was able to do all the patient care except for the, the lifting. Um, and I knew exactly what I was doing. And, and and the, the members of the squad were just super impressed. And they were like, wow, this is, this is amazing. You take that back to, to my school um, atmosphere and the school is going, okay, what's going on, Jace? Because you just got 100% on the state test for the uh, ECA level, uh, you, know, uh, you know, test for the rescue squad. And, and again, my answer was because I, I'm, I'm interested in it because I'm saving lives with it. And, and that's why I could do it. And they were just like, Oh, and, uh, and, uh, that's, that's kind of where that went. But the, the piece that ties this all together, um, and I kind of got off on a tangent there and, and, uh, sorry about that. But, uh, the piece that ties this all together was 
there was a member of the rescue squad at that time who owned a martial arts school in town. And at that time, I didn't think much of it because I'd gone back to years ago when I was eight, uh, when I was told that I couldn't train because I was in a wheelchair. Well, I was no longer in the wheelchair. Uh, when I was 11, I had surgery uh, that helped me get out of the wheelchair. And it was the worst you know, pain of my life, but it was well worth it. You know, and I was surrounded by family and friends. But uh, ever since that day when I was 11, uh, I haven't been back in the chair since. But uh, so through my time at the rescue squad, I, I met this lady who had a martial arts school. And, and I kind of, you know, just went back to what I was told many years before. And it made sense. You know, if you can't uh, stand to punch and kick, then you probably really can't do martial arts, right? I mean, that's what that's what you would think, you know, right? Yeah, so, seems reasonable. Um. So I just, I kind of went along with my, uh, with my life and said, well, martial arts probably isn't for me. That's probably one of the things that I, that I can't do. You know, I was older and I kind of realized that, you know, everybody has limitations or whatever. So now we take that story of my early childhood and and we, we tie it back to where, um, where I was when I left you trying to find a career. So um, the job placement coach put me at the radio station because I had a friend whose mother said, boy, you like to talk. You ever thought about being in radio? And I thought that'd be perfect because basically you, you work a four hour air shift, you go home, you hang out. And, and all I saw was the, the cool aspect of it. And I was like, that's for me, you know? Um, so I started out uh, through a state program, answering the phone and, um, I almost got myself thrown out because by then, um, like you said, I was 18 years old and I, I had all the answers. Um, yeah, I knew where I was going. I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew from all this volunteer work that people would take advantage of the skills that I had and that they, they probably wouldn't want to pay me if they, if they didn't have to. And so I was on a six week program and, I was supposed to be answering the phones at the radio station. I was sneaking into the production department to learn how to put together commercials because it was, you know, using computers and, and all the stuff that I was comfortable with uh, from growing up. And I would sneak in there and I had a fellow that took me under his wing and, and showed me this stuff on the downtime. But the general manager came to me and he goes, uh, son, you're here to answer the phone and you keep sneaking into production. And I said, yeah, because I'm here to learn radio. And if I'm not going to learn radio, then I'm, I'm going to leave. And he goes, you can't talk to me like that. He goes, you call yourself a ride and get out of here and, and never come back. And I said, that's fine. You know, I was like, I guess this isn't going to work out for either of us. Um, and so I went in to, to tell my friend goodbye, you know, that I'd kind of blew the opportunity. And um, he goes, you go back in there and apologize. I said, I didn't do anything. I, I said, he's the one that was, was sort of taking advantage of me. And he says, well, he said, you told me when you got into this, if I took you under your wing, he said, you told me you'd grow up and, and kind of, uh, you know, learn the ropes and, and, and not be, not be such a punk kid anymore. And I see, yeah, I did. And so I went back in and I apologized and, uh, I finished answering the phone, but, uh, one day they had a, a candidate come in, uh, he was running for office and, um, nobody was around, you know, my buddy that was the head production guy was was gone somewhere. Uh, it was just me and the general manager. And he comes to me, he says, Jace, we got to get you in the studio. He says, this guy's coming in, he's recording. And, um, he goes, you got to do it. And I said, why? Well, I, I, I can't do it. He says, I says, the phone will ring. And then, you know, you'll get all upset because I'm not answering your phone. I said, and then you're going to fire me. And my dad will have to come pick me up and all. He's like, no, no, I'm telling you, just do it. And so, so I did. And that was my, that was my break into production. But the, the cool thing about that story, uh, Jeremy, was that this candidate actually had a disability himself. And, um, and he was like, man, you know, he's like, tell me your story, you know? And I, and I told him and he goes, that's amazing. And I didn't let him off the hook. I was like, no, that, that doesn't sound good. Take that again. Or, you know, try try this with this inflection. And, um, by the time he left, I thought, well, this guy's never going to want to work with me again. And he said, he goes, this is my first dad. He says, I've got a series more to go. He says, I want you to be the producer. And, um, so that was my, that was my break into radio. And, and from there, 
Um, you know, I used that time as my hands on college. Um, I learned everything I could. I wanted to be on air, but because of the cerebral palsy, um, some of my muscles are weak. And one of those muscles is my diaphragm muscle is weak. So, you know, no matter how much I practiced, I, I just wasn't going to be the, the Casey Kasem kind of guy, you know? Um, but I finally realized that, you know, um, you're given certain strengths and, and things like that. And my strength was production. So I really, um, I got into that and excelled with that. Um, and, uh, had a, had a 20 year career in radio. Um, as you know, from what I told you in high school, um, writing and reading were difficulties for me, but I, I learned how to write copy and I actually wrote the award-winning copy. I've got a couple of Vermont Association of Broadcasters awards for my copywriting skill, as well as uh, production skill. And, um, during my time at radio, uh, I, I met a guy, uh, we were coworkers kind of in the same cubicle, if you will. And, uh, and this is where all of this starts to come together, Jeremy, uh, you know, in terms of martial arts and, and me and the organization, um, we were, we were sitting talking one day about, um, about our favorite martial arts movies. And, and I said that mine was, was Roadhouse, you know, and, and Patrick Swayze was, was, a you know, uh, the guy I wanted to be, you know, and, uh, and he goes, well, you know, he says, uh, I'm half Japanese. He says, and, uh, I was going to be a sensei. He said, but I couldn't afford the uniform. I said, well, did you know that I was going to train in martial arts? Uh, but they told me I couldn't. And, uh, and then I never would cause I was in a wheelchair. He goes, well, that's pretty stupid. How's that ever going to work? And I said, I don't know, but I'm about ready to find out. And I got a hold of the lady that, um, owned the martial arts school in town that I knew from the rescue squad. She was actually on vacation on the beach somewhere. And, uh, it was, it was mid afternoon. So she had a couple of drinks and, and whatnot. And I, and I, uh, sent her a Facebook message and said, Hey, uh, I want to train in martial arts. Is that possible? And she said, sure, Jay, you've, you've grown up with my kids. She says, you know, that anything is, is possible. And I said, okay, well, when do we start? And she said, well, I didn't really mean with me, but yeah, I guess I can train you. And, um, so we, um, we got together, um, and, uh, basically the first introduction was me falling down her, her stairs at the time. Uh, the, the building she was in was not necessarily the most, uh, handicap accessible, but I wanted martial arts so bad that I was willing to figure out how to get myself, um, get myself there to her studio. And we started training. She knew nothing about disability. She had a, uh, uh, a kid's class and that's all she, she had. And we started training and she learned about disabilities and, and I learned about martial arts and I learned about disabilities as well. And, um, and from that comes, comes the, the adaptive martial arts association. Uh, Danny, any questions? To this <laughs> so point many or? questions. So many questions. <laughs> I, I, I think up and up to this point, I think we can, you know, we can follow along with your journey. We, it, uh, even if it's not something we've experienced personally, we've all experienced challenges. We've all experienced being told no, and having to find ways to move through. But this part at the end, when you finally do get the opportunity to start training. From there to forming the organization, I think even even that path, in hindsight, can make sense. Oh, I'm I'm speculating. You want to make sure that others who had similar challenges weren't told no. You wanted to make sure others had the opportunity that you didn't when you were a child. Am I am I guessing right? Absolutely, you you hit the nail on the head. Um, and and to me, it was okay that they were told no. That that was okay, but to be told no over the telephone before you even take a look at somebody, that's what, what didn't set right with me because how do you know somebody's abilities, uh, true abilities, until you take a look at them? For me at that time in my life, I mean, um, so I'm 31 years old at this point, Jeremy, and I'm, I'm set to be married in, in oh, about nine months. And... Um, and as far as my physical health goes, you know, I was in pretty good shape. I, I maintained pretty well. 
Um, but um, I was having some trouble with some some extra tightness in my legs, and so I went to see a specialist, and he said, "You know, I want to put you on on mus- muscle relaxers." And I said, "No, I'm not, I'm not one for medication. We're not going to do that. That's that's not what it's going to." He said, "That's the only option." And I said, "Really?" I was like, "That's the only option." I said, um, "Well, I just started in martial arts. I was like." Why don't we give that a try and see what happens? I said, because uh, in the short time that I've trained in the, in the, it was probably three, four months. I was like, it's done some pretty amazing things for me. And, and, uh, I was like, why don't, why don't we give that a try? He goes, you can try anything you want. He goes, but nothing's going to work other than this medication. And I said, okay, well, we'll see. Uh, and, and I, I kept training and I incorporated the martial arts into my physical therapy and, um, you know, Jeremy, when somebody has been doing, uh, physical therapy since they were two, it, it becomes pretty old and, and the chances of actually staying on top of that and doing what you're supposed to are, are slim to none. And so for me, uh, martial arts was kind of a way to make me do the, the boring part of the exercises and the, and the physicality of it. Um, because I knew that I wouldn't be able to do martial arts if if i couldn't walk and if i wasn't flexible and so martial arts was kind of the vehicle to help me do my physical therapy then i go back to the to the doctor six months later you know and he's amazed at how i can control the clicking in my my heels and the crossing of my feet and he goes how are you doing that and i said it's the martial arts training i said it's about concentration uh mindset and 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 those things, all those those pieces that are tough to explain to somebody who doesn't know martial arts. And he's like, "Wow, this is amazing! We need to tell other people." And I'm like, "Yeah." And so, Jeremy, a lot of my ideas and and uh, things like that come to me in the middle of the night, and um, and you know, for commercials or anything. So it's the middle of the night, right? And so my wife and I are, you know, snoozing. She's like, you know, dead to the world snoring, you know? And I'm like, hey, hey, wake up, wake wake up. I was like, I got something to tell you. And she's like, what's the matter? Some emergency or something? I was like, no, but this is going to be huge. I was like, I was like, I want to start this organization to help others with disabilities uh, have an opportunity to experience the same um you know, wonderful things that I have through martial arts and, uh, and never be turned away. And she, and she was like, Oh, that's, that's great. I'm going back to bed. And I'm like, no, seriously. I was like, you got to write this down. I was like, it's going to be called the adaptive martial arts association of the green mountain. She's like, whatever. And she writes it down. Okay. I'm going to sleep now. And, uh, so, uh, there was one other girl in a wheelchair that was actually training down south, uh, with a, with another instructor. Uh, at the time. And I was like, no, I was like, you know, we'll have tournaments and, and, and we'll get together and we'll showcase this. I was like, you know, cause this is, this is something great. She's like, great. I'm going to bed, you know, forget about it. I'm going to bed. And, and so from that point on, you know, and then I brought it into, to my martial arts instructor and said, what do you think? I was like, you know, I can be the, the driving force behind the idea, but I'm pretty green with martial arts. I don't know much about it. You know? I said, uh, would you be able to, to help in terms of, of the, the martial arts standpoint and, and giving people the information they need? And she said, Jay, she says, you're the only student I've ever worked with. And, um, and so we had a, we had a she eye and up until that point, Jeremy, I didn't believe in my martial arts abilities. I kind of felt like, you know, she was, you know, being easy on me or, you know, because she knew me. And so she said, you don't believe me. She says, but you're really, you're really good at this. She said, I'm going to bring in an outside tester uh, to test you. And he tested me and he said, no, he says, you're, you've really adapted to this well and, and you do it well. And I said, so you really think that this could work for somebody with a disability? And he said, yeah, you know, this is with the right mindset and some modifications. Yeah. So myself and, and my instructor, you know, I founded the organization and, and she was, kind of the, the person that would, uh, would field the questions from other instructors on how to train. And so you may say, well, what is this organization or, or how does it, how does it work? And, um, 
basically what the organization is, is it's a, uh, well, now it's a, a national organization, which provides uh, information and other resources to instructors on how to train individuals with disabilities. And we also help uh, individuals with disabilities get placed in martial arts schools in their area. Um, what we say is if you're a martial art school that's listed on our directory that's, that's willing to take on somebody with a disability, that you don't necessarily need to take them on, but you need to be willing to offer them a, you know, a face-to-face -face interview to see if you're able to train them. And if you're able to train them, that's great. You know, we'll provide you the support in training them. If you're not, you send them back to us and we continue the search until we find them a school that fits both the need of the uh, student and the instructor. Um, and we also provide um, scholarships for individuals um, on fixed incomes uh, to help with transportation and to cover the, the cost of, of classes. And, and all of this is, uh, is free of charge, Jeremy. So that's basically in a nutshell what the Adaptive Martial Arts Association is. Wow. It's pretty amazing, pretty powerful um, stuff. Yeah, and, and so I just I want to take you back for a second Please. into to building building that. Um so building that, I was like, okay, well, this is great, you know, I'll just I'll get a hold of other disabled agencies. I'll talk to martial arts schools around the area. Everybody be on board for this. And basically, it was quite the opposite. I called some disabled agencies, and they said, what do you know about helping people with disabilities? It'll never work. Nobody cares about martial arts. Um, you know, all they care about is, is snow skiing and, and horseback riding. And how do you even know that this is going to help people with, with disabilities? And I said, because it helped me. That's how I know. And, and, and you'll see it, too. But you got to, you know, jump on board with us. And they said, before we're even going to talk to you or tell people about you, you're going to need to show that you have major support. And I hung up the phone and I said, well, thanks for your support. That's great. Um, and I Googled uh, Century Martial Arts. Uh, they were the world's uh, leader in martial arts supply. And at the time, they had Bill Superfoot Wallace as a spokesman. And um, so I Googled Bill Superfoot Wallace. And um, I found a number and I called the number and somebody answered the phone. I said, hi, is this Mr. Bill Superfoot Wallace's uh, headquarters or office? And he said, office or headquarters is Bill. What do you need? And I explained to him what I was trying to do and, and what I wanted to do. And he said, man, I support it. He says, you get a hold of my buddy over there at Century. He says, David Wall, he said, and he'll hook you up and uh and get things going and so i got a hold of, of david wall and months and months went by and i i heard nothing and then um a few months later i got an email that said we love what you're doing uh we'll be able to provide uh individuals that you help with a uh, uniform discount and so that's kind of how it all started but i had a, a vision for this thing i mean um very much uh a grand vision, really, a grander than any anything that any guy from Vermont could probably ever come up with. Um, you know, I wanted it to be a, a international organization and the, the place where everybody went for all the answers in terms of adaptive martial arts and, and all the support that they could offer. And I wanted it to be free of charge because I feel like everybody should have the same opportunity as I did. Um, and so I just I kept working and, and plugging away and trying to make the, the non-believers believe. Um, and um, fast forward, you know, try to get to be a speaker at the Century uh, Super Show in Las Vegas. And just really, um, just really, I knew where I needed to be and I, and I tried to get there. Um, wasn't able to be a speaker. Uh, again, had some, some flack about, you know, uh, we're not really sure about this thing called adaptive martial arts and so i said okay well if i can't be a speaker then i'll at least be a guest at the show and i i uh they're like i was like what does it cost to be have a booth there and they told me and they said well we're not really sure somebody you know could could raise that kind of funds to to be able to be here but we'll save you a booth space and if you can get here and that's what i did locally i went around and said look there's this thing i want to do it's very important 
Uh, you're going to be helping tons of people. Uh, and I raised the funds to get to the show. You know, I got us a booth. I covered the flight. I got at the show. And once I was at the show, something that I learned in radio was that you take somebody else's event uh, and you make it your own and you make sure that you're the, the biggest thing in the room. And I hit every booth there and, and just, just talk like I, I had it all figured out. And, uh, and it, it, it kind of started to come together. Um, and then this is the part where the wheels kind of fall off Jeremy. And, uh, and I, and I began to think, well, maybe I'm going to throw in a towel. Do you have any, have any questions to, to this point? No, nope. nope. keep going. I'm loving the story. We go to the super show and, um, and I take my instructor with me who, like you said, was a close personal friend for probably 20 or 30 years. And I knew her, her, uh, kids and grew up with them. And we go to the super show and, uh, we start kind of telling what the organization is about. And at the time, you know, looking back on it in retrospect, like we said about being on this show, uh, we really had no place being there, but, but we made it work. You know, we got the word out and we made it work. We figured it out when we came home. But after that show, when we came home, uh, the, the paradigm started to change. Uh, my instructor, uh, who was also one of the consultants, I began to look at things different. I mean, we had lines and lines of people out into the lobby to see our booth and one of the things I remember is on a break, um, she comes back. She says, Jay, she goes, this thing is going to be huge. Do you know the amount of money you're sitting on? I said, it's not about money. It's about helping people. And that's all I want to do. And um, the, the, the paradigm for her began to change. Um, and, I, and I trained and, and things like that. And before you knew it, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, in order for you to progress or, or do certain things, you know, you've got to do certain things with the organization. And I was just like, I can't afford to lose any of this. I worked too hard. So I just kind of went, aw- went along with the way the wind blew. And the board of directors came to me and said, Jay, you know, this isn't your vision. This isn't what this is all about. You know, you've got to do something. And so, so I did, I, I finally said, look, you know, uh, it, I understand, you know, maybe, the monetary aspect of this for you is important. I was like, but I, I don't think that, uh, you know, this is going to work anymore. Um, and so, so she parted ways from the organization. Um, and, uh, we continued to try to train, but the dynamic just didn't work. Uh, you know, when you mix the two things together, it just doesn't work. And so for me personally, it was, it was kind of, kind of very sad and it it still is. Um, you know, and, and she goes, you know, why don't you just leave this martial arts thing to me anyway? You know, you, you know, I've got the school and, and you don't really know much about the instructor and anyway, just leave it to me. And I was like, uh, no, I, I don't think so. I'm like, I'll figure it out. And, and she goes, no, I just need to focus on my own school. And I don't think this is working out. And so I said, respect to you there. And, and we kind of parted, parted ways. Um, and she, opened her own nonprofit organization with very similar acronyms less than a mile away and, and swore that it wasn't competition. And, and to this day, I have to believe that, but uh, in the back of my mind, I, I kind of wonder. Um, and again, the message was, why don't you just kind of fold it up and, and leave it to me? And I'm like, no. So um, by this time I, I built, built a pretty good relationship with uh, Leon and the, and the folks, at Sentry. And um, in case you haven't figured out what the theme is through this podcast, is I don't give up. There's no can't, no quit, no excuses. And so I took this thing and I, and I rebuilt it. Uh, and, I, and I tweaked the vision and I got some people around me. We got some uh, other martial artists on board that, that uh, could give training advice. I went and got an uh, uh, occupational and physical therapist on staff who you'll be talking to later, um, in another episode and, um, and just kind of rebuilt the thing from the ground up. I mean, we were really struggling, but I wasn't going to quit. So I rebuilt the thing and, um, and that's where we are today. I mean, so it's been a, it's been a process, but it's been well worth the process. And now we're, 
we're looking at international status. We've got some people in uh, England that are looking to open the first uh, international chapter of the Adaptive Martial Arts Association and um, looking ahead in that realm. And, and to be honest with you, um, I really, I, t- I took everything that I learned from radio and every aspect of what I learned uh, and, and I plugged those things into the Adaptive Martial Arts Association and it seems to be working and, and the folks in at Century and, and other folks are just like, wow, this is a new fr- you know breath of fresh air uh, as an approach to, to look at things. We're doing some uh, research and development for them on some adaptive product lines. We've got a, a podcast um, I do video blogs, so it's all the things that I'm comfortable doing. I've, I've plugged into this and, and for me, I was a big, um, super huge wrestling fan of the eighties and, and you take, and you look at what the WWE was in the beginning and, and those struggles and you, and you match them up to what we're doing. And it's pretty much the, the same thing with a different brand. And so what we're doing here is, is building a brand. And, um, and someday, you know, it, it'll be where I wanted to go. I've got the vision. Um, we've got, uh, members from all around the country now. And, and the thing was, was before we were even ready for national status, people started to come find us. And now that we have kind of the national status under our belt and we're comfortable with what we're doing, now people are coming at us internationally and and so we're not quite ready for that but we'll we'll be there and and the main the main point that i want to to get across to people is that um you know it's not about me and it's not about my story it's about the other stories that you hear and it's about the the other folks with disabilities and stuff they have overcome but my point is to tell you that you can do anything you want to if you put your mind to it and there's no dream that's too big or or too small and you've got to take all that negativity and all those people that try to, to put you down or hold you back and use that as your fire to continue and say, no, this is, this is what I'm building and, and this is how it's going to be. And just don't stop until you get there. I don't, I don't think there's anything more martial arts than that sentiment. The idea that you keep banging against the problem until it happens. I, th- I think we've all experienced that, whether it be, learning a particular form or a certain technique or maybe sparring with a certain person in class and, you know, feeling like you're not getting anywhere, but refusing to stop and ultimately getting there. And, and, you know, I think most people in your shoes, maybe I shouldn't say most, many people in your shoes, when things uh, didn't go well and it required parting ways with someone that you had looked up to and respected and, and I get the sense cared for, that would have been the the nail in the coffin for that dream. I think for a lot of people in in a lot of circumstances and the world is filled with these cautionary tales, but you had something bigger. You had a why that was pretty substantial. And I think we can roll back to moment one in our conversation that that why is pretty apparent. You know, you weren't going to let anyone tell you no. And, And I have incredible respect to your parents for, making sure that that was instilled in you because we wouldn't be talking without that. Yeah. You know, uh, my, my parents and my family are, are, uh, you know, were and are a, a big, big part of this. And, and, uh, and, you know, I, I know they're proud of me and, and, um, for me, it, it just seems surreal, but it's all, it's almost like from the time I was little, you know, I, I just knew that something like this was, it's going to happen. And, you know, and I'm like, ah, no, you, you're just kind of thinking that in your head, but it, it really, I mean, it, I keep popping back to it. And, um, and, and, and I'm not where I want to be yet. Um, you know, and, and everybody is like, well, what are you, what are you training in now? And, and I, if you haven't figured it out, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty brutally honest, Jeremy. And, and I'll tell you, you know, right now, um, after, after that, uh, after that, uh, training with my, with my first instructor, um, I really haven't found a, a good fit for me, you know, and I, and I've tried to go back and, and I'm like, you know, I, I wish, you know, ill will and, and, uh, anything like that. And training is training, but we, we both decided that, you know, 
for me to go back there and train is, is probably not the best option. So I've, I've tried a couple of different mediums and things like that um, to, to train in. And I, I just haven't quite found the same, the same fit yet. So am I a martial artist? Yes. Um, you know, am I training right now? No, but I'm about to, uh, I'm about to, to try a new journey. I'm going to try, uh, Taekwondo in the first part of the year and see if, see if that's the fit. You know, I think I found a, uh, an instructor that gets me that understands it and uh, I'm going to give that a try. Um, do I use martial arts every day in my life? You bet. Uh, whether, whether that's, you know, controlling anxiety or whether that's um whether that's in the classroom as you as you talked about uh before we started this interview i do um substitute teaching and i use martial arts every day in the classroom to control the classroom and and to know how to speak to people and to know uh how to get out of people what i'm looking for and everybody thinks of martial arts as punching and kicking but I can tell you from personal experience, martial arts is is so far away from punching and kicking. That's just one aspect of it. Martial arts is about being a better person, about being able to utilize those skills and the mindset to uh, help you through your day to day. That's that's the true opponent is the day to day. You know, getting through life, and and martial arts helps me with that. You know, every day in my life. So, am I a martial artist now? Yeah. Am I training now? No. But will I be? Yeah. Yeah. And so listeners, one of the things that we haven't talked about is that even though Mr. Davis and I haven't met, he doesn't live that far away. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna push him a little bit, you know, once once we get off this call and and make sure that that he knows there are even probably I've got I've got an idea of who you're talking about and I know of some other options too. So uh if if we follow this path of refusing to give up and working to find the way forward. I, I have no doubt that that's going to uh, resolve itself. And, and it's not a, absolutely uh, no. it's not a situation that you're alone in. I mean, there are plenty of people and I know others listening to this show right now because they write to me and excuse me, just for whatever reason, you know, it, it's, it's work schedule or it's where they are or, you know, they're injured or, or whatever it is that they're feeling pressured against that identity, their, their belief in themselves as a martial artist, because they're not training as much as they want to, or they're not currently training. And, you know, I've been pretty open too. I don't train as much as I want to, but that doesn't change the fact that I love training and I love martial arts and it's part of who I am just as it is for you. So Jeremy, I, I talked about kind of comparing this organization to the, the WWE and, and, and my wife is one. She's like, you do realize that, that the, the WWE is, I won't say the word fake, she says, but do you realize that it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, what you see there is, is less than the truth. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, you're, you're not getting it. I said, I'm looking at the WWE strictly from a, a business standpoint. And so as, as you heard me before, I, I talked about, incorporating radio into this and, and the elements that I do with the podcast and things. But I feel like it's my job as the founder of this organization to kind of be the spokesman for it and, and to be that driving force that continues to show people with disabilities, you can do anything you want to do. So as I told you earlier, I look up to my older brothers and, and um, in that time when I wasn't training, um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I, uh, I kind of got, got fat and my brother called me out and he goes, Hey fat boy, it's, it's time to hit the gym, you know? And, uh, I was like, well, okay, well, thanks. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know I gained a couple of, couple of pounds over the holidays. He's like, no, seriously, it's time to, to start hitting the gym. And he hooked me up with, with his personal trainer and I, and I hit the gym and that combination of my traditional physical therapy, the martial arts, uh, cause I had found a tr instructor, uh, and started training again. Um, you know, and, uh, the combination of, of that and the gym and the personal trainer and, uh, 
it was all clicking and, and things like that. And, uh, my brother had done the, the Spartan race on, on Killington the year before. And I said, uh, I said, next year, we're going to do it together. He's like, well, you know, he says, I never, I never discourage you. He says, but it's, it's pretty tough. He says, it's really tough. He says, and I don't know if it might be, might be downright dangerous for you, you know? And, um, he says, I, I don't know. And so I went up to watch him race and and I spoke to a gentleman up there and he said, are you in the Spartan? He says, you look like you're jacked and like you're an adaptive athlete. He says, we have a category for that. Are you, do you do that? I'm like, no, no. I says, but I, I'm going to do that next year. And he goes, well, there's this team you're going to have to get a hold of. He says, it's Team Believe 923. He said, and they help individuals with disabilities do obstacle course racing. And so I got a hold of them. And basically that team, all they do is, is support the athlete. They don't, they don't tell you how to do it. They just support the athlete with what you need. They'll carry you through sections that you need. They bring a specialized chair. Um, and so they allowed me to have a team around me of my choosing. And I chose my personal trainer, my brother, um, our, our family vet, who has really become a, a close personal friend, um, who is a, an obstacle course racer beast. And uh, if anybody and knows obstacle course racing in this area. And you, and you mentioned the name of Robin Crossman, uh, they'll definitely know who it was, but so we formed a, a team. And, and for me, it was a pretty special day because, uh, a year's worth of training went into it. Uh, I was doing my job as the adaptive martial arts spokesman. I mean, I went and got sponsors, uh, Sentry gave me that I couldn't find any gear that I needed. Um, in obstacle course racing that would work for me because a lot of it was done on my hands and knees and things. And Sentry was wonderful enough to say, this is what you're doing. We know why you're doing it. Just to spread the word about the fact that anybody can do anything they want to. And, uh, and we're going to help you. And so I had some, some fight shorts with sponsors on them and, and I, I really did it up. And, um, and so I got to choose that team and, and I chose my brother to be on that team. And that was, that was kind of like my going back to eight years old and saying, yeah, I'm going to do this with my brother. It was, it was the one, one time we actually got to do something together on the same playing field. And, uh, it was, it was a pretty cool experience. And Killington is the toughest course on the Spartan, um, circuit. And, and I chose to do it. And the, and the team believe tried to talk me out. I said, that's the one I'm doing. This is when we're doing it. Either you can come along or I'm going to do it alone. And we, and we, we did it together. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I use martial arts every step of the way for that. I mean, everybody looked at the course as this long course and how it was going to be so tough. And, and I broke it down and I, I paid attention to my breathing and I stayed focused and it was one obstacle to the next, to the next, to the next. And I came up over the, the cargo net, which was the last obstacle. And I felt like I wasn't going to be able to go anymore. A, I'm afraid of heights and B, I was just gassed. It took me over 10 hours to complete this course, uh, but I completed it and I'm going up over the course and um, somewhere along the trail, somebody had a, uh, uh, a USB speaker and they're like, Hey man, nice job. What's, what's the song you need to hear to keep going? And I said, I of the tiger. Well, by the time I got to the end of the thing, they're shutting the lights out. I'm like, don't shut the lights out. I'm I'm coming. I'm almost done. And that person went to the end and, and said, play I of the tiger. That'll push him up over the top. And, and I just, I climbed up over the top and, and, and down and I did it. It was Facebook live and, and so to me, I accomplished two things that day. Once again, I proved that with no can't, no quit, no excuses, anything is possible. And if you want it bad enough, you'll go get it. And I got a chance to do something with my brother on the same playing field. Um, it was, it was just a really cool uh, experience and it, and it brought some huge exposure to our organization. So for me, that's, that's what it's about. I mean, right now we're just trying to get the word out about the organization and, and the work we do. And, and as I told you, for me and the people around me, it's not about the money. It's about helping other people 
realize that they can be more than they thought they can and be the support for them uh, to be able to do that. And as far as instructors go, to teach them not to be afraid of folks with disabilities, but learn how to how to help them and, and know that there's support out there, there for them uh, in doing that. And that's what we do. Awesome stuff. And a pretty powerful story. And I, I, it's one that's got me kind of fired up. And, and I can see you there with Eye of the Tiger. And, and that's a song that, that'll get me fired up too. You know, flashbacks to, to Rocky and, and uh, something I've never mentioned on the show before when I used to compete. That was a song that I did a musical form to. So there's a, a special place in my heart for that song. So as you're talking about Eye of the Tiger, like I'm, I'm moving around. Like it's, I can't sit still when I'm thinking of that song. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. <laughs> well, if people want to find out more about what you're doing in your organization and maybe they're interested in helping or uh, actually, you know what, before we get there, let's, let's ask two questions. If someone is an adaptive hopeful martial artist, what can you do for them? You talked a little bit about that, about that. And I think the part we didn't really talk about, if someone is a martial arts instructor or school owner, and they want to make sure they're doing what they can to be supportive of adaptive martial artists, what can your organization do for both groups of people there? So for the adaptive martial arts student, they can come to us, visit our website, adaptivemartialarts.org. Uh, there's a form there they fill out, a little bit of background on themselves and their disability. And uh, then we begin a search in their area for a school that may be listed on our uh, free national directory of schools that are willing to interview those with disabilities. Uh, and if we don't have a school listed on that directory, then we will uh, hand search uh, out a school in their area until we find one and get back in touch with them, uh, help them set up an initial interview with the instructor, let the instructor know that they're coming, find out if the instructor would be okay with it. And then, um, you know, hopefully we get them training and we provide support for both the student and instructor to continue training and have the same successes that I've seen. Cool, awesome. Uh, as far as, whoops, I stepped on you. No, that's right. I just just chiming in saying that's great. I mean, that that's I, I think a lot of organizations would stop at the point of, sorry, we don't have anyone. You know, but you talking about that you're gonna go out and you're gonna dig until you can find someone. I mean, that's that's powerful. And I think that that as a function of the organization is a testament to you. I mean, that that's I mean, that's you in a nutshell, isn't it? We're not gonna say no, we're gonna find a way. Right. Yeah, and and those searches actually, believe it or not. Um, as much as the organization is, <coughs> pardon me again, <clears throat> and those searches, believe it or not, as much as the organization has grown and, uh, you know, folks within the organization want me and my wife to kind of let that aspect of things go and, uh, to let that aspect of things go, uh, we actually do those hand searches ourselves, you know, so my wife researches the schools and and she's not as much of a talker as i am so i do the calling and and all of that but uh, we still we still keep our hands uh in that and we're very close to that part of the organization it's it's important to me because you know i'll try to change somebody's mind on the phone like oh well you don't train somebody with a disability but that's okay but if i told you that we had free support and and things like that to, to help you tra train them, would you change your mind? And uh, and I'll I'll just keep them keep going until they finally say, yeah, you know, you've you've made me feel comfortable enough to uh, to be able to at least take a look at this, you know. And I I don't pressure, but I I just want people to just take a look because how do you know if you don't if you don't try? Exactly. You know, and on on the instructor end of this, what we provide for the instructor is we have a board of physical and occupational therapists, along with um, martial arts instructors that have worked with individuals with disabilities for a number of years, um, who will uh, help you either create or modify an adaptive martial arts uh, program. Uh, we answer questions. Um, 
you know, through the wonders of technology, we can do uh, a video call with them and, and help them figure it out so that they too experience the, the wonder that, that is adaptive martial arts, because it's, um, I've been, been on both sides of it, Jeremy, from the, the student aspect to the training others with disabilities and, and both sides for me have been very, uh, rewarding. And, and so I want to be able to give that to somebody else. Okay, great. And how about social media? Is there anything like that people can follow? Look us up on Facebook at the Adaptive Martial Arts Association and you'll, you'll find us there. Um, they can call me 802-747-8184 and um, look forward to hearing from them. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time today and, and your openness with telling your story. One more thing. I, I appreciate that. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to, oh, I was no, going to send I, you out. I'm going to send you out the way that we, that we, we always do, or rather ask you to send us out. And that is, you know, give us some parting words. You know, if you, if you were to wrap up the episode right here, right now, what would you want people to remember? That uh, anything is possible with the, the proper mindset and with the, uh, with the, the moniker, no can't, no quit, no excuses. What a great conversation. I love talking to people who are passionate about the things in their lives, and I especially love when that passion is martial arts, and it extends beyond their training. We've talked recently about a martial arts lifestyle and what that means, and Mr. Davis is unquestionably living a martial arts lifestyle and trying to spread that to others. And he has my full support. His organization has our full support, and I hope you will consider supporting it, whatever that means to you. We've got another episode coming. This is the first time ever we have foreshadowed an episode because we've already recorded it. The next episode, 467, will be with two people involved in the Adaptive Martial Arts Association, talking about things from the martial arts side and from the occupational therapy side. They were fascinating conversations, and I know you'll get a lot out of them. And that's why we're releasing both of these episodes in the same week. So check out episode 467 once it comes out. or. If you're listening to this later, it's probably already out. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for coming on, for sharing these people around you with our community, and just for everything you're doing. It's great stuff. Please, don't stop. If you want to check out more about this show, the upcoming show, all of the shows, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Find the show notes pages, find the links, find the social media, find everything, and learn more about today's guest and everything that's going on. If you want to know more about what's going on with us, whistlekick.com is the place to go. You'll find links to Marshall Journal and our store and our blog and our social media. And if you want to support us, and I hope that you do, there are a few ways you can do that. You can make a purchase, use the code PODCAST15. You can share this episode or another episode or anything that we do. You can follow us on social media at Whistlekick all over the place. And you can leave us a review on Facebook, on Google on Amazon, anywhere that makes sense. Go ahead and do that. And then there's one final way you can support us. Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And we've got original content for those of you who are willing to step up and support us. So thank you for those of you throwing a couple bucks a month at us. It means a lot. It means a lot to me personally. If you've got a suggestion for an upcoming guest or a topic, reach out. You can email us. You can fill out the form on the website. Lots of ways you can do that. My email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Thank you to everyone who supports and reaches out and sends me your thoughts and tells me your stories because that means the world.